Welcome to episode 14 of the Gluttons for Punishment podcast or GFP, a Toronto Maple Leafs and NHL podcast hosted by Michael Lapore and Anthony Bruno. He's Lapore. I'm Bruno. Thank you so much for listening and watching us on YouTube as well. If you're a new listener, we would really appreciate it if you gave us a five star rating and review on Apple. And if you're watching on YouTube, it would be a big time help. If you smash the like button, subscribe to the channel, and ring the notification bell so you know exactly when the GFP podcast is posting some new content. All right, so the Toronto Maple Leafs are 9-0-1 over their last 10 games, and they are a perfect 4-0 since our last episode. So, as of Sunday, April 11th, 2021, Masters Sunday, the Toronto Maple Leafs are in first place in the NHL standings with 59 points. They have the third best points percentage, and we are going to get into the week that was and give you our thoughts and opinions on everything that went down with the Leafs. But before we do that, it is time to welcome in my partner in crime, Mr. Michael Lepore. How are you doing, buddy? Doing great, Bruno. Another uh, Leafs win last night. Episode 14. Can you believe it? Shout out to uh, the man, Davey Keon, maybe the uh, greatest Maple Leafs player of all time. The only Toronto Maple Leafs player to uh, win a Conn Smythe trophy. Maybe there will be some change to that in the near future. There, I said it uh, early in the show, but uh, things are good, man. Like you said, great week for the Leafs. Four wins. Gotta love it. Let's do it, bud. Let's crush it. Love it, man. Yeah, shout out to Dave Keon, my father's favorite Leaf of all time. So, I met him a few years ago. Absolute gentleman. Oh, gotta Absolute love it, man. Gentleman. And yeah, Lapore. Hopefully, if we're getting closer and closer to the playoffs here, things are gonna start heating up, and Ooh. Leaf fans are expecting. You know what they're expecting. We know what we're expecting. <laughs> all right, everybody. So let's get into the last four games since our last podcast. Um, so. We're going to have to go back to last Sunday. The Leafs were in Calgary playing the Flames. They beat the Flames 4-2. to two. Michael Hutchinson was in net. Jack Campbell was sitting out. Uh, they're managing his workload a little bit. It seems like that injury scare is is behind Campbell at this point, I want to say. But I'm sure the Leafs are still going to you know, keep an eye on that and continue to manage his workload the rest of the season. But yeah, Michael Hutchinson picked up the win. Um, the Leafs' power play was still really bad at that point. And guess what? It's still pretty bad right now. <laughs> pretty but, fucking bad, yeah. But they started things out with a 4-2 win, and then they played the Flames once again on Monday night, picked up a 5-3 win. Jack Campbell made 26 saves, improving to 9-0 and on the season. And the Leafs finally scored a power play goal in that Monday night game against the Flames. That was their first power play goal in 12 games. So yep. it was nice to see them finally finally light the lamp on the man advantage. And then on Wednesday, the Leafs returned home to play the Montreal Canadiens. They beat the Habs 3-2. to two. Jack Campbell set a franchise record with his 10th straight win, moving to 10-0 and on the season. William Nylander uh, missed out on this game because he had exposure to a possible positive COVID case with a close contact outside the team. And we're not exactly sure when he's going to be back in the lineup, but he also missed the Saturday night game as well. Um, yeah. So hopefully Willie can be back at some point because obviously the Leafs are going to need him, you know, heading down the stretch and into the playoffs. And then they close things out on Saturday night against the Ottawa Senators in an absolute circus of a game winning six yeah. to five. Jack Campbell set an NHL record for the longest season opening win streak, passing Carey Price's record. So Campbell's now 11-0 on the season. Austin Matthews has had his third career hat trick. He now has 31 goals in 38 games. Absolutely ridiculous. He had four points. Marner had four points. Galchenyuk had a couple assists playing on the first line. So uh, Lepore, since our last podcast, the Leafs a perfect 4-0, man. What did you think? Well, not too much negative to say, except for that power play. I saw a stat. I think it was Luke Fox posted it. In their last 34 power plays, the Leafs have been outscored three to one. Unbelievable. I saw that on Twitter as well. Crazy. Like they're so giving up all these shorthanded goals and they just they just can't figure out this power play, man. It's it's yeah. insane. What's so weird is that you know, every team, every time a team goes on the power play, they post like 
where they rank in the league and all that. And I still think they're like eighth somehow. Like that shows like how guns are blazing. They came out to start the season. But anyways, lots of time to talk about how bad the Leafs power play is. Uh, we'll start things off with that Flames game, the 4-2 win. Uh, Riley with a quick goal. Good to see him get on the score sheet. As we've talked about previously, we're not getting a lot of, a lot of goals from our D. So it was nice to see that one. I actually thought the Leafs fucking fell asleep. Uh, after that goal by Riley, there was like a point from like the mid first period to the mid second period. Calgary fucking dominated us. And actually full credit, man. Hutchinson made some big saves he did. to keep he that game. At, yeah. Because like the flame scored two goals and he made some big saves. There was one power play in particular where there were two or three of them. And he kept that game at two to one. And then uh, Galchenyuk, he scored to tie it at two. It was his first goal as a member of the Toronto Maple Leafs. He went uh, pretty fucking bananas. Um, then it was in the third period, we got uh, the go-ahead goal from Javaris, an ugly one. They went off uh, Hannafin skate. If you look at the replay on that one. He smashed his stick against the bar. It was uh, pretty close to uh, Markstrom's head, actually. Like Markstrom kind of gave him a look, man. There's a few years ago, I forget what player was. But I'm picturing, I don't know why I'm picturing like a Sabres player, but where someone actually did clip the goalie in the head after oh, being God. angry it and trying to smash his. Player. Yeah, it's probably I'm, I'm probably envisioning a <laughs> Sabres player because it would happen to a Sabres player. Uh, and then yeah, Matthew scored um, from Marner, and it was the uh, that was the uh, so that was not the power play goal. That was in the next game. I'm getting my, my wires crossed here. That was what Matthews made a great play to keep it in. I feel like the replay, the puck came around the boards. Matthews made a great, I'm not going to call it defensive play because he was to keep it in the zone. But the, cut, the puck came to him, uh, put the Leafs up 4-2. to two. The Leafs were actually outshot in that game. We haven't seen that too often. The final shot count was 34-30 to 30 in favor of the Flames. But our friends at Money Puck had the game at uh, a 58% win for the boys in blue. Which has been the case pretty much all season, Lapore. Like, yeah, it's, it's 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 getting kind of weird. Like, you just go to moneypuck.com on your phone. It seems like it's always in the 60s and 70s for the Leafs. So uh, we're getting kind of arrogant <laughs> in that regard. Or when you see it, it's kind of even close to 50. It's like, ooh, ooh this, what's wrong, boys? Yeah, what's even going it, on here? Yeah, he didn't dominate another game. Yeah, even if it's like 55, 45, we're like, oh, let's snap out of it, guys. Put your foot on the foot on the gas. Um, so moving on to the uh, second uh, Flames game, it was the uh, 5-3 win. This game was a little bit bananas. Uh, you had Spezza scoring one uh, in the first period. Puck uh, came out in front for him. And then you had Matthews, uh, typical shot from Austin. What's hilarious about that goal is Willie had the zone entry. It's nice to see them playing with each other once in a while again. Willie had the zone entry. And if you watch him, there's like this little delay where he knew Matthews was lurking. Like, he knew Matthews was around, and he's kind of turning his head, and he's like, I better get it to him, and he did, and Matthews does what Matthews does and rifled one into the net. Uh, unfortunately uh, for the Leafs, the Flames were able to tie that game at two, and then Wayne Simmons scored what would be the most Wayne Simmons goal ever from his knees with his stick down, smashes it in to put the Leafs up three to two. That, that's the ultimate Wayne Simmons. Um, and even his celebration of just like pure, like glorious joy of a warrior. Love it. Yeah, awesome. Uh, unfortunately for the Leafs, again, again, this game was bananas. The uh, the Flames scored shorthanded. That one, uh, it was a two-on-one. Riley kind of got his wires. Yeah, the backland goal, right? Yeah. And that was the same power play that they finally That's got right. the monkey off their back. So backland scores the shorthanded goal, and then the Leafs finally break their terrible power play drought. That's right. It was Matthews again, like you said earlier. It was their first power play goal in 12 games. JT scored the insurance marker. Final shot count on that game was 30 to 29 in favor of the Leafs. And again, Money Puck had the Leafs at a 53% chance to win that game. Uh, looking back at those two games, there's quite a bit to dissect. Um, I had the Galchenia goal as something that can feed into a lot of discussion and more pop the question of like, what exactly is Alex Galchenia to this team? Who does he best slot with? And where do we see this going forward as we make our steps towards the playoffs. Do you have any immediate reactions to Galchenyuk and where he sits with the Leafs? Yeah. So I've been really impressed for the most part with how he's played. And I like how the Leafs eased him along and they had him in the AHL. I think he played like six games with the Marlies 
yeah. before they finally brought him up. And you know what? This is a guy that has – he has the pedigree, right? A former third overall pick, former 30-goal scorer, a high skill guy. He obviously bounced around. I believe the Leafs are his sixth team yeah. in the NHL. In like five years or like something. Like, it's crazy. And he's the dude's bad. only – he's only 27 years old. Yeah. You know, bad. we're not talking about a guy who's 31, 32, who's bounced around the league a bunch of times, right? I mean, this is someone who essentially should be in their prime right now. Now, is he the Alex Galchenyuk of old? No, but there are flashes when he's playing with good players, right? When he's playing with Tavares and Nylander or when he's playing with Matthews and Marner, as we saw on Saturday night against Ottawa. Yeah, like I've been that. impressed. And, and here's the thing with the Leafs, right? They're always going to have the big four. So you have Matthews and Marner together on the first line, Tavares and Nylander together on the second line. And it's just a matter of finding that third guy to play with them and having guys with the ability to do that. And obviously throughout the season, we've seen Hyman play with, with both of these lines. And Hyman can obviously play with anyone, right? I mean, he's a yeah. very versatile player. We've seen Wayne Simmons get a chance to play in the top six. Same with Joe Thornton. Same with Jimmy Vc when he was still on the Leafs. And I think they've finally found a guy in Galchenyuk who has the ability to play on either the first or second line on any given night. And okay. I think that's all you can ask for when you're, you know, paying a guy less than a million dollars or whatever it is. And, you know, I'm not expecting him to, to, to go out there and start lighting the lamp and, you know, being the 30 goal scorer that he used to be. But I want a guy who can consistently play with the top end guys on the team and fill in when he needs to, whether it's, you know, on the first or second line. And I think he's done a nice job. Lapore. What are your thoughts? Uh I got this. I have two sides of it. Cause like, I agree with you in the way that you can put him there and he doesn't look out of place because he has the talent and you can tell by his style of play that he's skating his ass off. Like, let's face it. This guy's probably playing for his career at this point. Like, yeah, like that's a said, good point. Like you said, six teams, like the show might be over for Gouch after this. So I like the effort he's putting in and I think he fits in with these guys, but are you comfortable with him being that sixth guy? Like, are we good enough if Alex Galchenyuk is that sixth guy? That's where I question it. Because where the alarm bells go off for me is that if we're putting a player with Nylander and Tavares or with Matthews and Marner, for that matter, whoever they decide to do it, if what we're circling is how hard they're working, I think that's a bad sign. Yeah, that's not good enough. No, it's not good enough. Like, we can't just have a guy out there who's working hard. And yeah. digging pucks out of the corner. And a guy like Galchenyuk, that's not what he's good at. Galchenyuk is a high skill guy who should be zipping the puck around with these guys, using his speed, using his skill. And and I see where you're coming from, Lapore. Like, can can the Leafs do better than Alex Galchenyuk as say the you know, let's let's say you, you put Hyman as the fifth best offensive player, right? Behind the big four. Like, are the Leafs, you know, a great team slash Stanley cup threat with Alex Galchenyuk as the sixth best player in the top six. That's, that's actually, you bring up a good point. Could they improve on that? Yeah, I think they can. At yeah, the that's right. That's where I think they have circled. Cause then like, it's that holding moving guys down. Like then you, if you put Galch on the third line, now you have something like now you have a matchup nightmare for the other team with whoever you put Galch with on that third line. So I think that's the target for Toronto come Monday and we'll see, man, but I'm not going to say like, I'm like freaked out about it, but again, like <laughs> when the positives are, wow, look how hard he's trying. I'm like, uh, <laughs> like I, I want to hear more than that. I want to see like, like specific things, like look at that talent or look what he's providing for the other players or look how he's distributing pucks or finishing for that matter. So, and even for Tavares, man, like we've talked about him on this show a lot in the way this has not been a good year for him. Like he looks good. It's so weird because he looks good. He's been awesome defensively. His points aren't terrible, but like the fucking puck's not just going in for him. And you look back to two years ago where he did have that 47 goal year. I mean, he was playing with Marner. So he had one job clearly on that line and it was to fire the puck in the net and it worked. I mean, 47 goals for crying he out loud. couldn't miss that. Year. Oh, it was amazing. And then, like, last year was kind of a write-off because, like, he again, like, all the weirdness of it. And people forget that he broke his hand. Yeah. And, yeah, I mean, and we can talk about this one all day, but, like, he had his uh, he had his newborn baby as well. 
So, so and then you throw in like COVID, like a lot was going on. He still had a good year. I'm just saying to like compare it to yeah, his it's first a lot year to the, deal with. For yeah, sure. and again, not letting him off the hook, just to say that compared to his first year with the Leafs, and even this year, like here you have him playing with Willie, which is great, but he deserves better. And it's that whole thing that like, man, does John have to work this hard to produce? So like, that's the guy, like, that's what I circle in the way that I want to see some support for him and just make his life a little easier. And like, we've, again, we've said it before, we know what we're going to get out of Tavares, but from a production standpoint, if they can find the right player for him, man, like, I think it would do wonders like for the team and for him specifically. No, I, I, you bring up a good point. And I think it's kind of a, a double-edged sword, right? Because you look at the past, right? And Leaf fans were always frustrated. Like, why the hell isn't Mike Babcock playing Matthews and Marner together? Like, this should be a match made in heaven. Yeah. And obviously, Keith has transitioned to that. This is now a thing where they're line mates. And I think they're going to continue being line mates for the duration of their contracts because they're incredible together. Yeah. And we see the elite skill they both possess. But at the same time, now you're taking Mitch Marner away from John Tavares. Yeah. And William Nylander, as much as we both like him, and you know we both think that he's a high-skill guy and has the ability to be an elite player, he obviously has some consistency issues when it comes to being in that top tier. He's not as good as Mitch Marner, and he's not going to create the same types of plays that Marner does. And because of that, now John Tavares is going to have to work a little bit harder. And like you said, things are not going to come as easy to him. And and you see it out there, right? Tavares yeah. has to work super, super hard to get his opportunities. Whereas before, he could kind of do what Matthews was doing in a way. And it's not to say that Matthews isn't working hard for his goals. But, you know, you talked about, you know, even in that Flames game where you said like Nylander came over the blue line and he's just kind of waiting for Matthews behind him, right? And the same thing with Marner. Every time he skates into the zone... He's just kind of delaying, delaying, yeah. and he he knows that Matthews is is finding a spot somewhere, right? Yeah. And now John Tavares, he doesn't have the luxury of doing that, right? And especially, you know, Nylander isn't the playmaker that Mitch is. Mitch is like arguably like one of the best playmakers in the NHL. So it's been tough for Tavares, and you could see it. I mean, it's not just the stats, right? You can see it watching watching him game in and game out. He's been frustrated this year, man. He's yeah. been really frustrated. Things aren't coming as easy. And adding another player, another really good top six guy to play on a line with him, I'm sure that could certainly help. And and I'm sure Kyle Dubas is, is going to look to do that before the, the 3 p.m. Eastern deadline on Monday. I'll throw this one out there because he's had actually a really good year. And I remember this being, like this specific player being rumored to be a perfect piece to play with Marner and Matthews early in their career. Because we're, I'm, a, I'm not going to say we have a problem trying to find that sixth guy, but does this team right now, and I'm not saying I feel this way, I think it's a good discussion. Does this team right now regret dealing away Connor Brown? Not really, because I, for example, like, I, I'm, I'm saying like, like Nylander, Tavares, Connor Brown, or Matthews, Marner, Connor Brown, and then Hyman, like that's yeah, not he, bad. He's kind of he kind of reminds me of Hyman, right? I, I think Hyman's a better player, but now Connor Brown, I believe, has like seven goals in his last seven yeah, he, games. He broke the Sens record, and even someone pointed out like they've had Danny Heatley, Marianosa, Daniel Alberton, Jason, Jason Spezza, and that record now belongs to Connor Brown. No, that's that's a good point, Lapore. At the end of the day, when you look at Connor Brown, he's he's a solid like twenty goal scorer, yeah. right? And he's not going to score you twenty goals every year, but. He's a guy that has the ability to hit the 20 goal mark every season. And, and that is a guy that, that, you know, you could say the Leafs miss someone like that. Is he the ideal fit in the top six? I think you could probably do a little bit better, but you know, you, you could use a 20 goal scorer right now to be playing in that top six. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we can talk about finances and all that in his contract, but I'm just kind of, I thought Connor Brown, it reminded me last night that like, yeah, because I remember early on it was, yeah, everyone thought it was going to be Matthews, Monarch, Connor Brown for the next decade. And like, it wasn't going to be touched. And then we just had to move out some, some depth. And I mean, he found a spot in Ottawa and it's looking good for him. So, but yeah, more on the flames, man. The coach we all love and adore Daryl Sutter. Things aren't uh, going too well for Daryl. And the flames and he doesn't look and, and it's pretty obvious because he's pretty vocal about how things aren't going very well 
Uh, I know you, uh, Daryl Sutter fires you up, Bruno. How are you feeling about Daryl Sutter today? Lapore, thank you so much for bringing this up because I have a lot to get off my chest and a lot to unpack here. Okay. So everyone knows how we feel about the flame situation and Daryl Sutter. We didn't like the hiring at the time. Let me just go over the current situation with the Calgary Flames, okay? So they were 11-11-2 under Jeff Ward. They were clearly a very, a very mediocre hockey team. They didn't have an identity. They weren't terrible, but they were struggling, and changes needed to be made, okay? So you have Brad Treliving, who essentially did not do any sort of coaching search, Lapore. He didn't go out there and do some extensive coaching sh- search. He fires Jeff Ward and immediately brings in Daryl Sutter and signs him to a three-year deal, okay? Mm. This is a guy that hadn't coached in the NHL since 2017, and there were reports when he last coached in the NHL that he was literally locked out of the King's dressing room because yeah, it got to a point that the players tuned him out and could not stand the way that he was essentially coaching the team. You can go check this out. There's an article on sportsnet.ca that goes over this, this situation with Daryl Sutter. So, so you have a guy that hasn't coached in the league since 2017. He's 62 years old. He's been enjoying life on his farm in Viking, Alberta. He comes in and Flames Twitter and Flames fans, they love this move because they think about 2004, Daryl Sutter leading the Flames to the Stanley Cup final against the Tampa Bay Lightning, falling a game short. You know, everyone talks about Daryl Sutter getting the best out of his players. And, you know, there, there, there isn't a better man for the job. Well, guess what, Flames fans? I, and listen, I know that they beat the Edmonton Oilers 5-0 on Saturday night to snap their losing streak, but they are now 6-9 and nine under Daryl Sutter with a minus-7 goal differential. And all this talk about Daryl Sutter getting the most out of his players, that simply isn't true. Because let me run some numbers by everybody right now. (laughs) You can't prepare. You can't prepare it, eh, Bruno? (laughs) Johnny Gaudreau had 24... Sorry, Johnny Gaudreau had 21 points in 24 games under Jeff Ward. He got off to a really good start this season. Okay, and I'm sure Flames fans remember, Johnny Gaudreau was was great to start the year. Under Daryl Sutter... He has six points in 15 games. Fuck. And his ice time is down almost two minutes per game. I didn't even know about the points, but wow. Okay. Six points in 15 games under Daryl Sutter. Sean Monahan. Okay. As I look at the numbers right now, Michael Lapore, 17 points in 22 games under Jeff Ward. He also has six points in 15 games under Daryl Sutter, and his ice time has decreased by over a minute per game. Then let's go to Matthew Kachuk, okay? Who hasn't been normal Matthew Kachuk that we've seen over the last two years. He he struggled a little bit this season. His ice time, Lapore, is down three minutes and 45 seconds per game That's from surprising. Jeff Ward to Daryl Sutter. Almost yeah. four minutes a game. He's the one you think, I mean, typical Daryl Sutter would love. That's like but the anyway. perfect Daryl Sutter player, right? Yeah, what the fuck? And while all this is happening, Daryl Sutter is playing Milan Lucic two minutes and 18 seconds more per game than he was getting under Jeff Ward. That was my next question. Because when you were saying all these, when you were listing these guys and their minutes going down, what was popping in my head was, well, then where are the minutes going? (laughs) But you answered my question, at least partially. So it's, it's just so, so frustrating to me that I hear all these things and Flames fans were so happy about Daryl Sutter, but... You need to look at the results here. And where is this team headed? So back to Brad Treliving for a second. He has now hired four coaches in the last five years. Okay. So let's let's just go back a little bit. So he hired Glenn Gullitson. He only lasted a couple of seasons. Then he brings in Bill Peters. And Bill Peters led the Flames to the second best record in the NHL in 2019. It seems okay. like so long ago, eh, when they went on that tear. It's, it's, it's crazy. It's weird, and, and, yeah. And that was only a couple of years ago. Johnny yeah. Gaudreau had his best season under Bill Peters, 99 points. Matthew Kachuk, Sean Monaghan, they all had great seasons. Second best record in the NHL, number one seed in the Western Conference. We all know what happened with Bill Peters with the allegations of racism and assault. That yeah. didn't end well. So then he pivots, 
and he hires, he, he brings in Jeff Ward as the interim coach, eventually makes him the full-time head coach. And the Flames were okay under Jeff Ward. They, they won a qualifying round series against the Jets, then lost to the Stars in the first round of the playoffs last year. And then this year, like I mentioned, has been incredibly mediocre. So when it comes to Brad Living, and I know I'm, I'm, I've been going on about this, but I, I really, really have to get this off my chest, okay? He did not do anything when it comes to actually going out there and finding the right head coach for this job. Murray Edwards, the owner of the Calgary Flames and that ownership group, they love Daryl Sutter. They have a relationship with Daryl Sutter, like I said, going back to his time leading the Flames to the cup final. Yeah. This, this was easy for Brad for living. Okay. He knows his neck is on the line. And I think this is a situation where he said, you know what? Ownership loves Daryl Sutter. He's a hard nosed coached. Fuck it. I'm just going to bring him in and see what happens here because I have no more bullets left in the tank. So let me actually just bring in a coach that ownership absolutely adores. And, so weird. And Lapore, it, it just, it just has not been going well. Like, and I know they just beat Edmonton five, nothing last night, and maybe they can turn it around and finish the season strong. But here's one last thing I'll say. Everyone wants, you know, was talking about, well, Daryl Sutter came in now and he's going to find out who can play Daryl Sutter hockey and who the flames have to get rid of. But let me ask you this flames fans. Johnny Gaudreau has one year left on his contract after this year. Are you going to really? Bruno. He's and, gone, Bruno. Yeah, and yeah. I think he is too, but here's the yeah. thing. You're going to prioritize your 62-year-old head coach, Daryl Sutter, over your best offensive player, Johnny Gaudreau? You're, you're going to prioritize a head coach over Johnny Gaudreau? So really, you're just going to get rid of Johnny Gaudreau and then you're going to get rid of Sean Monaghan? And then what are you going to do? What the hell are you going to do, Calgary Flames fans? I, I just want you guys to think about this because is Johnny Gaudreau, can he be the best player on a championship team? No. But can he be the Phil Kessel to Evgeny Malkin and Sidney Crosby? Can he be your third best player on a Stanley Cup winning team? I think he probably can, Lapore. This is a guy we've seen score 99 points and lead the Flames to the number one seed in the Western Conference. Yeah, not too many guys in recent years have put up 99 points. So the last thing I'm going to say is just, Flames fans, you got to be very, very careful here. I know you love Daryl Sutter, and I know you want to play that Daryl Sutter brand of hockey, tight nose defensive game. Don't give up, you know, scoring chances and don't give up shots and win games two to one. But at the end of the day, you have Johnny Gaudreau, Sean Monahan, Matthew Kachuk, and Elias Lindholm. These are your core players. These are the guys you got to make happy, and these are the guys who are going to make your team successful moving forward. And yeah. Tread very carefully here with how the, the Calgary Flames approach the situation. That's it's, all I got to say. It, it's funny, and, and I'll ask you, do you think this move was made to signify something grand, like larger than a coaching change? And when I say that, I mean a full-on culture change within the organization. Like when they brought in Daryl Sutter, did the Calgary Flames staff know we are going to move bodies? that this is just the wrong group of guys, talented or not, and we're going to change things here. Like, I bring it similar to kind of like when the Leafs went through that transition when Burt came in. is that You kind of knew, like, hey, Antropov's gone, Ponikarovsky's gone. Like, it just seemed like we felt like Brian Burke's going to make us, like, this rough-and-tumble team with truculence. I'd say truculence. You think maybe that, that there's a connection there? Like, they knew what they were doing. And kind of like they accepted it saying, this is not working. Like you said, how many coaches they've been through in this amount of years that we're going to bring Daryl in to kind of change the culture here and build a team that he wants. To answer your question to a certain degree. Yes, I do. But here's the issue is that if you're going to trade Johnny Gaudreau or let him walk, like, who are you bringing in at that point? Yeah, I guess like, that's that. Uh, sorry, I guess that uh, now that you said that, we didn't really have a player like that. I guess when when but, we went through that culture change, it, it's like it's like you're not gonna get. It's either you got to blow it up at that point, as far as I'm concerned, because yeah, you're trading away your best which player. Which free yeah. agents is this team going to attract, Lapore? Like, I I don't see any big name star player picking the Calgary Flames and Daryl Sutter, who has now developed a reputation as. You know, he, he's a hard guy to play for. He expects a lot. He doesn't necessarily let you play 
your freewheeling offensive game. And listen, do you have to play a tight defensive structure to win in the National Hockey League? Yes, you do. But at the end of the day, when you have players like Johnny Gaudreau or even you know Patrick Laine and the situation he's dealing with in Columbus, you have to let these guys do what they do best. Yeah. Bill Kessel, who I brought up as well. Like at the end of the day, if if they are high skill players who can score goals and generate offense, you have to let them do that. It's so like, fucking annoying. Yeah, they try to like change them and all that. Like when you mentioned line, you everyone's like, oh, he's not going to be able to play Torts' style. Who fucking cares? Let him go out there and score thirty exactly. goals. Let like, oh my Patrick god, Laine, for the love of God, hundred percent, man. Same thing with like and and Phil Kessel. I think he was so successful in Pittsburgh because. He didn't have the pressure of being the guy anymore. They weren't asking him to do things out of his comfort zone. They said, Phil, go out there and play with Crosby or Malkin. Snipe your 30 goals. You know, be that offensive star that you are. And I, I still like Johnny Gaudreau. Yes, is he is he undersized and and is he is he a little bit yeah, he's a little small. He's not going he's not the perfect, let's say, Daryl Sutter slash like playoff guy, right? But this is a guy. Who, like I said, he he has a ninety nine point season in the NHL. Those guys don't grow on trees. It's it's so annoying with these like player comparisons. Like everyone, the best players are the guys who put up the points. End of like, story. Yeah, like you get these like comparisons and like oh the playoffs and this and that and like types of players. No, the guys who deserve the most money and the most important players are the guys who put up points. They always say the hardest thing to do in the NHL is score goals. Those are the guys. It doesn't matter. Scoring goals is hard. And then, oh, but he's got to play this style. No, he doesn't. Pay a guy a million dollars to do that. You need to exactly. score goals. And that's why it's just, it's just so it's so odd. And you mentioned them signing a free agent. Well, we're seeing by the shittiness of this upcoming trade deadline, there's not a free agents, not a lot of free agents to begin with worth uh, worth talking about. So, I mean, that's sign number one. But like, I remember, like one in one of our early episodes, we talked about the Flames. And we fired out a lot of compliments because like, things weren't going the greatest for them. But if I, remember, if I remember correctly, we went on rants about how this is the type of team, based on the talent they have, they could turn things around quickly. Absolutely. One of, oh, you had a guy, you had a piece here and there. Like, this could be a good team. They have good young players, players teams want. And now you have this, like, Daryl Sutter thing with the culture change or, like, as we're, we're predicting that that's the reason for this move, this culture change. And now it's gone from something that had a lot of potential in my eyes anyway, to something that now this feels like this is going to get blown up. And there's going to be a lot of takers, like for those guys. I mean, you, like Monaghan, Kachuk, if they all, if they were to get rid of all of them, I'm not saying they're going to do that. But there's a lot of pieces on Calgary people would come calling for if that's the direction they're going to take. Oh, absolutely. You, you think teams aren't going to be lined up to get Sean Monaghan, Johnny Gaudreau, or even Matthew Kachuk for that matter? I mean, these yeah. are really, really good players. Now, again, are they star players? Are they elite players who are going to be the, you know, the lead your team to a championship? No, I, I think the Flames are one of those teams that sort of a lot that lacks that elite level talent. They're not the only team. And guess what? It's a lot easier said than done to acquire Connor McDavid or Nathan McKinnon or Austin Matthews for that matter, right? Like, they're guys like that don't exist on every team in the NHL, but. Now the Flames are getting to a situation where it's like, okay, you guys want to prioritize Daryl Sutter? Well, guess what? Now you got to blow up your team and start from scratch. So I, I, if I'm a Calgary Flames fan, I wouldn't like that at all. You look yeah. at any sport. Once you start putting your coach above the great players on your team, Lapore, man, I think you're really, really playing with fire. Unless it's Belichick. <laughs> yeah, unless you're Bill Belichick. Yeah. Or even Greg Popovich, for that matter. Sure. And yeah. I mean, even look at the Spurs. I mean, I don't want to start talking about basketball and turn this into a basketball podcast, but they lose Kawhi Leonard, Tim Duncan retires, you know, like Manu Ginobili, Tony Parker, all those guys move on. And now look at the Spurs, you yeah. know? They're, they're not the elite team that they used to be. Well, he actually always says that. He's like, I wasn't a good coach until I got uh, David Robinson. And he goes on his rant. Like, he admits it. He's like, yeah, it's not me. It's the guys I was provided with, right? Yeah. So, yeah. again, we, we can go on for days about this. But, you know, just to end this off, Calgary Flames fans, you better be careful what you wish for here. Because if you're going to prioritize Daryl Sutter and move into the future with him, and listen, he, he has a three-year contract, 
He's got two more years after this. Then man, oh man, you better get ready to, to lose some of your good players and go through a rebuild because it's about to get rough there in Calgary. And how are they not? Okay, now I'm going to say, okay, like we were go trying to wrap it, up. Poor, yeah, we're going to wrap it up. Keep going. What he fucking said about Goudreau's 500th game, like that one comment about like, oh, I hope it's a lot better than his, than his 499th game. If you're a GM or you're a president, it's like, Daryl, I want to fucking see you in my office, man. Like, w- what was the benefit of that comment? Yeah, like, what good is going to come what out good? of yeah, calling so out Johnny Gaudreau? Now the media is shitting on us. It's embarrassing. It's going to get posted a- 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 everywhere, and you pissed off Johnny. Like, where are we going with this idea? Like, at what point is a good idea? Oh, you're going to motivate him, Daryl? He's going to play pissed off now? No, now he fucking hates you, and he's annoyed. Now he wants out of here. I hate to break it to you, but all these players in today's NHL are spoiled brats who've never been told anything in their entire life negatively. So no, that's it. You fucked up, Daryl. Like it just it's crazy. It's madness. Madness. You know what, Laporte? I'm glad you went there because listen, we're not inside that Flames locker room. You know, we don't have any inside sources in the Flames organization, but I can't imagine that some of these players enjoy playing ah, for they Daryl fucking, Sutter. They fucking hate his guts, man. Dude, even, imagine if you're a teammate of uh, Goudreau. Like what's being said afterwards? Like, did he just say that about Johnny? Like, yeah, come like, on! Like, it's called spade a spade here. It, it, it's just crazy to me, and and it, and that, and like, I just don't understand now what's going on in Calgary because, again, I'll, I'll repeat it. Like, you guys had a really good team two years ago, number one seed in the Western Conference with essentially this exact same core, and now all these core players seem kind of pissed off. Outside of of Lindholm, who I believe his ice time has kind of been the same under you know from Ward to Sutter. But everyone else is seeing their ice time get slashed. Johnny Gaudreau's playing barely over 17 minutes a night. He was playing over 19 minutes a game under Ward. Matthew Kachuk, almost, almost 20 minutes a night under Jeff Ward. Now he's down to 15 and change under Daryl Sutter. Like, get me out of here. Like, how get can any of, of those core players enjoy what's happening? Your best players have to play the most minutes, be on the ice in the important situations and produce and that's all it comes down to and if you're going to make your best players unhappy if you're going to start calling them out and making stupid comments that's going to make its rounds on social media i mean it's just it's just a bad situation man and i actually feel sorry for flames fans right now i really do because like we we said earlier in the season like this is a team that's that has good players. It's a nice team, man. Like, the Flames are a fucking nice team. Lepore, I thought they were going to make the playoffs this year. I had them a, as a playoff team. A lot of people had them in the playoffs. Yeah. If someone had told me at the, at the beginning of the season that the Flames would be fighting it out in that if we're near the top of the division, I'd be like, okay. Like, they picked up Markstrom. I mean, again, we've talked about their core. I wouldn't have been surprised at all. It's a nice team. 100%, man. Yeah, man. it's just... it's. It's it's about to get real, real juicy there in Calgary. Mm-hmm. And you know what? I'm just going to have my popcorn. I'm going to be enjoying <laughs> well, it on the sidelines. Lots of entertainment, yeah. So mo- should we move on? To what, yeah, to yeah let, on? let's finally move on, Laporte, to this, uh, this Leafs-Habs game on Wednesday. Yeah, we'll wipe off some sweat, and then we'll go to the uh, the Leafs-Habs game. So that one, yeah, always always uh, fun when the Habs uh, play the Leafs. It had been a while. I felt like it's been like... It, been it had been forever since we played Montreal. Uh, Matthew scored early in that one. Great wraparound goal. Corey Perry, who I love and who I absolutely hate to see in a Montreal Canadiens uniform, wipe away my tears. Tied it at one. Bad defensive zone breakdown for the Leafs on that goal, and we have not seen that. Yeah, a that lot. was brutal. He had like yeah. a wide open lane. He just Suzuki Su- Suzuki did the right thing. Like he kind of delayed, delayed, and the ice opened up, but it just it was a bad look for Toronto. Then in the second period, TJ Brody, our boy, with his first goal for the Toronto Maple Leafs. And what I found so I'm trying to find the right word here. I want to say maybe significant of this goal is what it symbolized. Here you have TJ Brody, and that's game what, like 30 something, 40 of the I think season? It was his 40th game of the season. Was it 40? Okay. Good guess. So he scores his first goal as a member of the Toronto Maple Leafs in 40 games. Took him 40 games. Have you heard one negative thing about TJ Brody all year? Not a single peep, Lapore. Not a how, single peep. How crazy is that? That this guy went 40 games playing in Leafland, did not score a goal, 
and you did not hear a single peep of negativity. That shows how good he's been in his own end. And that signifies how important of an acquisition he was for the Toronto Maple Leafs. I was so happy to see him be, be able to celebrate a goal that night. Uh, moving forward, Hyman made it uh, three to one, a typical Hyman goal, a rebound. Corey Perry, again, <laughs> scored to make it three to two, scoring a very uh, Corey Perry goal, if I've, uh, if I've ever seen one. Uh, some stats from that game, uh, Leafs outshot the Habs, the Habs 34-32. And the Leafs did carry the play. It was a 78% win on Money <sighs> Puck. So, but I mean, that kind of goes back to the thing we've been saying for a few weeks in the way that why'd you only win three to two? I mean, exactly. it was three, three to one. Montreal scores a late goal, but you dominate, 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 and you're scrapping at the end. I mean, we're happy to win, but again, not what we like to see. I mean, do you have any hard takes from that game? Yeah, no, you nailed it with this last point, Lapore. It was another game that I thought the Leafs just controlled, essentially, from beginning to end. I was never worried about Montreal. I mean, yes, did it get dicey at the end of the game? You know, it's a one-goal game. Final couple of minutes, Montreal pulls the goalie. You know, you think, oh, here we go again. Are the Leafs going to blow this game against a team that they're better than, a team that they dominated all night, a game that they should have won? But, you know, it's just one of those things where we've been seeing a game in and game out. And, you know, like you mentioned, the Leafs hadn't played the Habs in a while. Yeah. I, you know, I don't know exactly how long it had been. So I was really interested to see how this game was going to go because, you know, Montreal's comfortably in a playoff spot right now. And I think at this point, really all the playoff spots in the Canadian division are sewn up. It's just a matter of, probably who's going to finish two, three, four behind the Leafs in what order. But, you know, looking at Montreal, this is a team that I still think has the same issues. Like they, they struggle to generate things offensively, especially against a team like the Leafs, right? That possesses the puck that has all these high end players. It's tough on a team like Montreal. And I've said this on previous shows. Every time I see the Leafs play a team like Montreal, it brings me back to the Columbus series in the qualifying round where Mm. that's how a team has to beat the Leafs. They need really good goaltending and they have to capitalize on those two or three or four chances they get throughout the game. And if not, yeah. you are in deep shit against a team like the Maple Leafs. So that's my take on the Habs right now. Like, I don't know what they're going to do at the deadline, Lapore. Like, I don't see them making any like significant offensive move that's going to like put them over the top. So they're essentially going to head into the playoffs with Tyler Toffoli as their leading goal scorer, Josh Anderson. And these are two guys that have struggled recently. Anderson's name, yeah, his name has kind of disappeared off the face of the earth after his start. They've struggled, man. And obviously, they're not they're not deep down the middle. I know they added Eric Stahl, but at this point, you know, Eric Stahl is a depth centerman. He's Actually, I had even a, I saw a lot of Habs fans on Twitter, like, I guess, joking but not joking, asking if Stahl played that game. And like, once I saw that, I'm like, yeah, I don't remember stall. Oh, it was a man. weird one. Yeah. And, and we just saw them lose five, nothing to the Winnipeg jets. So man, this is a team that, you know, they How significant is no Gallagher. I know it's like one guy, but he's a big identity piece I, for their team. I think that's a big loss. Yeah. That's a really good point. Laporte. If they don't have him, like he broke his thumb. Was it? I yeah. think. Yeah. yeah. So his he's got to get or back his, or his hand. What, one of those he's out. Yeah. He's out like what? Six to eight weeks. I believe it is. Is it that long? I didn't even know it was that long. I or guess it, you may, break it may be four. It's in the six week range, I believe. Okay. But yeah. That, that's a big time loss because he's been one of the best five on five goal scorers. Never mind just for the Habs really over like the last five years in the NHL. Yeah. When he's right up there. You go look at the numbers five on five. That dude puts the puck in the net. Yeah. When, when he signed that deal, a lot of people were shitting on it saying, oh, that type of player, this and that. And I think it was Dom LeCision did the metrics on it. And they were like, no, based on his five-on-five -five numbers, that's a great value deal, like underrated for what he contributes uh, for the Canadians. But for Montreal, it's it'll be, it'll be interesting to see what they do Monday, if anything. And I guess all the teams in the division to see where they think they are. And like Montreal, because at the end of the day, like, hey, like let's let's be open about this. This is this division has received a lot of criticism about its strength. So maybe there's optimism in those meeting rooms about it's not going to take much to 
have a chance to win this division, especially like in that middle matchup. Like if we can get to the three spot, even if they're thinking we can get to the three spot and depending on who you are and who you're going to face, but essentially avoid Toronto. Yeah. You avoid Toronto in round one. Yeah. And it's like, well, fuck if we're, if we can envision ourselves in round two, well now we're in round two. So it'll be intriguing to see how Montreal handles the deadline um, and the other teams in the division. But yeah, guy Gallagher, man, that, that's an important piece. That's a really important piece, the identity of the Montreal Canadiens. And uh, I've mentioned on this show that the Montreal Canadiens scare the absolute shit out of me, just because like you mentioned, they're that type of team. And just all the drama that would come with playing the Montreal Canadiens for the Toronto Maple Leafs. But if they don't have Gallagher or Gallagher's not at 100, my fear goes down a lot. My my anxiety levels go down a lot in terms of the nervousness of that series because how great of a player I think he is and what I think he provides to the Montreal Canadiens. Oh, yeah. If you had to do like a power ranking of like the Montreal Canadiens' most important players come playoff time, I have Gallagher in the top three yeah, for uh, sure. And sure, like the, the Habs need great goaltending, whether it's Price or Jake Allen to play well and their defense core has to step up. But up front, man, Brendan Gallagher... The way that he just pisses people off, gets into the dirty areas, isn't afraid to throw his body around. He scores goals at five on five. Man, that's a player every team in the league would just love to have in their top six come playoff time. So, yeah, I just double checked Lepore. Yeah, so he does have a fractured thumb. He's expected to miss at least six weeks. So where does that bring him? That's the playoffs? Yeah, so six weeks from now, is, it's like right around playoff time. Because, yeah, because we only got what, how many games left? Like we're in the teens. So Yeah, because with the COVID situation with the Canucks, I think the schedule is going to be extended out to May 16th. Okay. So the playoffs would pretty much start the week of May 17th, you would think. So it's going to be right around that time, I guess, that Gallagher would be ready to go. Wow. Um, wow. And I think I think he's already, he's been out, I think, a week at this point. So... I mean, he should be back, but yeah, that's, that's, a, you know, it's like you said, who knows if he's, you know, if his legs are under him at that point. And yeah, I know it's a thumb injury and he's skating and things like that, but he's got to yeah. get his timing back and all that. So yeah, that's a, that's a big time loss, man. And, and I like that point you brought up about some of these other Canadian teams, maybe being desperate and seeing that there is an opportunity this year, how, you know, if you're able to avoid the Leafs in round one and you get the jets or the Oilers, you advance to that second round. And then honestly, it's anyone's let's, game yeah, at that let, point. Let's right? do it. Yeah. So that's yeah. why it's it's wide open at this trade deadline, man. We could see the Habs, Jets, or Oilers for that matter try to swing for the fences and and bring somebody in. But we'll see. Yeah. We'll see how it goes, Lapore. Uh, Spe- speaking of players that like every team would want, I was so I had it like almost written in stone over the summer that the Leafs were gonna get Corey Perry. Really? I just eh? thought well, I just I'm like, it's perfect. It's perfect. And he even said like way back when he was in Anaheim, when things were not going the greatest for Toronto, that he considered signing with the Leafs. Like the whole hometown thing, his family be great, but he just couldn't leave Anaheim. So like after comments made in the past like that, with where the Leafs are as a team now, with what he would cost and what he would bring. I mean, like the cliche things that people say about what the Leafs need. I just thought it was written in stone that we were going to get Corey Perry. And I'm not saying he'd be a big swing for this team, but he'd be nice. He'd be nice. I heard I heard someone say that it was between Simmons or Perry. And I don't know yeah. if the Leafs chose Simmons or maybe I'm creating something in my brain and Perry didn't even want to come to the Toronto Maple Leafs. Yeah. But I don't know. It, it, I think it would have been cool to see Corey Perry play for the Toronto Maple Leafs this year. And I think he, he could have brought something. He definitely could have. Yeah. Cause I'm going to just quickly look up Corey Perry's contract. Yeah. He only signed for 750 K. Yeah, exactly. So like, why would the Leafs not have done that? Yeah. So it's like you said, I guess maybe they pride, they just prioritize Simmons over him. Cause they're like very similar players, obviously. Right. Just in terms of everything they bring to the table. Yeah. yeah I mean, that's, that's a guy that come playoff time, you know, you're down by a goal he can get into the dirty areas and just shovel one in from in front of the net. You know, yep. he can change a series just by getting in someone's face and pissing them off. Right. Well, what do you get? What do you get last year? was like, I think he scored like three or four goals in the playoffs, but like two were overtime winners or something. He's just that guy. Right. And yeah. it may be getting those numbers a little off, but it was something like that. But yeah, what a play- hall of famer, man. What a player. Oh, absolutely. Former MVP of the league. I mean, former 50 goal scorer. That guy's, 
you know, awesome. team Canada, all those things. Great player. All right, Lapore. I mean, I guess we can, we can move on now to the final game of the week. Yeah. <laughs> against the senators. Uh, yeah, if Jack- I, I- I'm not fully relaxed from that game oh, yet. I'm, I'm, I'm still what shaking a, circus, a little bit. <laughs> Fucking disaster. So, yeah, like you're saying about Campbell. Yeah, 11 straight, man. 11 straight for soup. It's officially a record. We uh, we have something here. Can we finally say it? That, that we, we have something here? I think the Leafs have found some magic here between the yeah. pipes, Lapore. Yeah, I was, listening to, I was listening to the Steve Dangle podcast, and they were saying... You know, at what point, they're like, oh, he's not going to win it based on games played. But at what point uh, is Campbell going to get some Vez into consideration? Because, yeah, it's only X amount of games he'll finish with, but it's a shortened season, this and that. And they were talking about, like, yeah, maybe a nomination. Who knows if he keeps going? What if he ends up with this record? And then it was funny because they pulled up uh, Vasilevsky's stats. And he's like incredible. <laughs> His numbers make absolute no sense. So yeah, they're outrageous. Yeah. yeah so Vasilevsky has that award wrapped up. If anyone's considering Campbell uh, in that discussion, but uh, yeah, this was an absolute shit show of a game. And I don't know what it is with these two teams, but every time they play, this game is an absolute fucking circus. And it's just like a, it's it's a combination of like amazing skill. And a comedy of errors on the other side, too. And it goes both ways. So you get football scores. But so the Leafs go up 2 nothing, And I got a few uh, texts from some of my Senators fans, friends. And they were like, oh, this is over. We're shit. I'm like, guys, no. Like, this is far. It's too early. Like, this is going to be an absolute circus of a game. Just wait for it. And what happens? The Leafs, the uh, Sens score their three quick goals in uh, in the second period. And it's funny because one of those like game turnaround things. So here are the Leafs, two nothing up, and the Sens score their first goal. You go back and watch that first goal they scored. Hall got beat wide, and then the puck ended up behind the net, and then he got outworked for that puck. The puck ended up in front, scores two to one, and we've seen how this team has been able to better than in previous years lock games down when they have a lead, but that's all it takes. Like when you're two nothing up, that goal goes in. And here come the cliche statements of worst lead in hockey. But that fucking mistake from Hull opened this game up. So you have the two quick other goals. It's three two. We had Marner score, and then it was the McKayev goal, I believe, came after that. And then you had yes. yeah, and then again, Circus third period, Matthew scored. Uh, then there's the empty net. The Sun score just total Circus of a game. I may have messed up the order of all those goals, but it finished six five. Shots were 38-32 in favor of the uh, the Leafs, 70% on money puck. But again, in the third period, there was another goal that Hall got fucking destroyed going wide. And it was almost like he was acting kind of awkwardly in the way he, he, like, he didn't want to take a penalty. Like maybe that, I'd like to go back in some game, at some recent games. Has he taken a lot of penalties lately or something? Because both were similar in the way that he was skating with the player and he was kind of reaching, but not really being aggressive. And he allowed the Senators player to kind of cut in and just fucking brutal. And he was fighting the puck all night. It may have been his worst game of the season. And I hate to speak negatively of a guy who's had as good of a season as he has. He's been a great surprise for us. It only makes 2 million bucks to be in your top 40. It only make $2 million is a plus. And we'd all agree on that, but they got out with the, they got away with a W thank God. As far as the Sens are concerned, uh, Sheldon Keefe after the game had a lot of, of positive to say about the Sens. He went off about how he thinks that team's as good as anyone in the Canadian division right now. And it's full on time, time to respect them. And you, you never want to say there are like moral victories. You always hear that statement made by coaches and GMs and players. But I think last night was kind of like a moral victory for the Sens, at least for some of them. I mean, their kids look really good. They were skating, they were scoring Stutzla. Oh, that uh, Stutzla shot. That was yeah, sick. And that was his first goal in forever. Like, it's kind, yeah. he's kind of, kind of fallen off the radar and, like, rumblings of, like, uh, like this kid not looking as good as he first. He's still putting up points, but, you know, he started guns a-blazing, maybe was going to win the Calder, and that kind of got shunned. But what a shot that was. Batherson looked good. Um, yeah. I think it was a good solid game for the Sens. I mean, you never want to let in six goals, but again, I think I think kind of like a moral win for Ottawa. 
I mean, I don't know how you see it. I mean, you've said before that I like to talk about Ottawa being in the senator's country over here. So maybe I dissect this in the sense more than I need to, but I'll let you go at that game now. No, Lepore, I, I think you nailed it with the senators. Like at this point, you got to respect them because you look at their last, you know, 20 plus games, they've been pretty solid. They're not the senators that they were at the beginning of the season. And they sure as hell aren't as bad as the Buffalo Sabres and, you know, some of the other bottom feeders in the league. And I know when you look at the standings, the senators are still right near the bottom, but they've been playing a lot better and they've been close in a lot of these games, not just against the Leafs, but against some of the other, you know, some of the other teams in the Canadian division. And, you know, I, I was laughing when you, you texted me last night uh, right after the game and you were talking about Jack Campbell because on previous shows we've yes. talked about how his numbers are just ridiculous. Like he was going at a 950 save percentage. Then it went down a little bit to about 945. And then he lets in five goals against the Senators. And now the regression is over, Laporte. We're good now, That's yeah. It. He got the regression out of the way in one game. His save percentage is now down to 934, I believe. Yep, 934. So, you know, which still is still... Still world, but yeah. <laughs> which is still high, but it's not outrageous like it used to be. Um, so you just knew at some point that, that Campbell was going to have one of those games. And I'm not saying that, like, oh, every goal was Campbell's fault. Like, he was terrible against Ottawa, but... No, we were fucking shit on our own end last night. That yeah, was the problem. Yeah. Exactly. Defensively, the Leafs were kind of all over the place. It was a mess. But you know what? It, it was another game. I'm happy that Matthews and Marner just said, everyone get out of the fucking way. We're, yeah. we're just gonna we're just gonna save the team tonight. We're gonna combine for eight points. You know, it's one of those games where their defensive structure wasn't there. It was very sloppy. And sometimes you need that. You know, you need your best players to just say, F it. This is going to be a 6-5 game, and we're just going to put the team on our back right now. And yeah, and you're going to get those track meets once in a while. It just it just seems for us it's always against the Senators. I don't know what it is. Bet the over, everyone. I texted my buddy. I'm like, how are we not just betting the over every time the Sens uh, play the Leafs? Oh, my God, sell your house. For real, it's, it's unbelievable. And again, I don't know if it's the Leafs, you know, thinking – like some of these other teams have been thinking like, oh, it's the Senators. This is an easy game tonight. But this Senators team, man, you know, like we've been saying, they've been playing all these teams pretty tough. And, and it's only a matter of time until they continue to get better. They progress in their rebuild. But yeah, a, a lot of positive signs from the Ottawa Senators and positive signs from the Leafs as well. Because when they went down 3-2 after Stutzla scored that goal, you know, you could see things maybe going into a tailspin. You know, especially considering they gave up a shorthanded goal as well, right? Yeah, you see them fuck. bounce back. And you know what? If, if a game is going to be a wild shootout and it's going to be 6-5 and 11 goals are going to be scored, I want, I, I want my team to win that game at least, okay? I know it's not the, the poster child for best defensive game of the year, but if it's going to yeah. turn into a crazy game like that, at least win the game. And that's what yeah. the Leafs did. And let and the coaches deal with let the coaches deal with the bad stuff stuff, stuff that they want to talk about. A hundred percent. And based on the way the Leafs have been playing defensively this year, I'm going to let them off the hook for that game against the Senators. I mean, you go look at the numbers. I've been talking about it at nauseum all season. The Leafs, they're still eighth in the league in goals against per game. They're top ten in shots against per game. This has been one of the most sound defensive teams we've seen in Toronto in a very long time. So if they're going to give up five goals against the senators one night, I'm going to let them off the hook. Lepore. Yeah. Should be an interesting deadline, man. Any, any final thoughts you want to get in before we, we wrap this thing up? No, I just hope something happens. It'll, it'll give us some ammunition for, for next week. I'll, I'll feel so bad for those guys on TSN just sitting there. Oh like, God. Waiting for deals waiting for deals to come through. I saw an interview once with uh, James Duthie. And he said that he's actually gone to um, the management to TSN asking, because it starts at like 9 a.m. or like whatever time they started at. And he asked if they could start it at 12. So if, if, a, if rarely, rarely do deals go through that early. So he's, you know, we'll just start at 12. And then if a deal comes through, we'll just quickly talk about it. And then we'll move on as like if deals actually come through. And they quickly squashed that idea because they showed him the ratings and people are watching. 
Wow. I, I think it's that thing. Like people have it on in the background, you know, this and that. I, I just, I've wondered now, like in the era we live in with like everyone has a smartphone and Twitter, if the ratings have plummeted, because really, why do you have to watch it? Yeah. Like you get, you, you could just track it on Twitter. You set yeah. the alerts, you set your alerts for Elliot Friedman, if Chris you know, Johnston. Yeah, you're Chris done. Johnston like, yeah, and all those so. guys, Pierre Lebrun, and you have all the deals at your fingertips. Yeah. And I don't care to hear what like Jeff O'Neill thinks of the deal. So. I mean, yeah, whatever. he just looks miserable on the panel. You can yeah, I like Jeff O'Neill. I'm just saying. You can just tell he, he'd rather be on the golf course. 100%. Than sitting did you, there for 10 hours on trade deadline day. Uh, did you see that uh, that sprint thing they oh, did God, the other? Oh, God, the combine? Yeah, with the that overdrive was, guys. Uh, that was a bad look, man. I couldn't J- believe Jeff. it, man. It's like, dude, you were a 30-goal scorer. Oh, no, I thought the same league. thing. I thought the same you thing. You were the fifth overall pick in the draft, like, I would like to think you're a better athlete than what I saw displayed oh there God. in that in that combine. He struggled. He, he like that was it a hundred meter dash or he did like a forty yard the yeah, forty it was like yard a forty yard dash. Like oh my God, he looked like he was finishing uh, like a ten k or something like when he crossed the finish line. But that was rough, man. That's a yeah. bad. That's a bad look for hockey players, man. Yeah, no, I, I think there's some beer in that bloodstream. But anyways, oh God, that was we love we love you, Jeff. Though. Yeah, shout out to Jeff O'Neill, Leafs the legend, drive guy. Yes, yeah, Leafs legend Jeff, Jeff O'Neill. O'Neill. All right, Lapore. Yeah, so coming up next week, the Leafs have the Habs, Flames, Jets, and Canucks on the schedule. So it is a four game week. Let's go. And uh, yeah, I mean, it should be exciting, Lapore. Any, any, anything you're looking forward to this week with those four games? Uh, I guess. See where this. Let's let's keep at it. Let's keep winning. I mean, this team is what nine zero and one in their last ten, so you'd like to think they're gonna fall into a losing streak or a slump at some point. But just keep it going. It seems like the scoring is getting spread around, and we're getting goaltending when we need to get goaltending. Like we said, Hutch looked pretty good in that uh, last game against the Flames. So if he's got to step in, we're not as nervous about the situation as maybe we used to be. And uh, yeah, let's keep it going, man. Why not? Let's run the table again. Yeah, absolutely. 15 games left this season. The Leafs have a pretty comfortable lead at this point atop the division. So at this point, just just cruise home. Yeah. And I'm sure it might get a little bit tight in the standings down the stretch, but I think the Leafs are going to pretty comfortably probably finish in first place here in the final 15 games. Just just stay healthy. Don't get into a crazy losing streak at this point. Just keep it steady. And I think everything is going to be just fine yeah nothing is ever fine <laughs> it's never fine no, nothing is ever fine. <laughs> never 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 ever. all right but that is going to do it for episode 14 of the gluttons for punishment podcast or gfp with michael laporte and anthony bruno thank you guys so much for listening once again it would really really help us out if you gave us a five-star rating and review on apple podcasts and it would help us out even more if you went on youtube where you're watching us and you smash the like button, you subscribe to the channel and ring the notification bell so you know exactly when the GFP podcast is posting some new content. So that is going to do it for episode 14. For Michael Lapore. I'm Anthony Bruno, and we will see you in the next one. Thanks, everyone. Oh,